<laughs> Except I have no people. You've got oh, people. Oh, you've got people. Your people. <laughs> see? You have oh, watch you know? I didn't even see you. <laughs> it's so little. Uh oh, so it's going to get a lot of attention. Right, we told oh, Matthew behaves. No, not you. Oh, wow. no. um, where did I come up with the idea? I came up with the idea in that um, Shavuot is a terribly neglected festival. And we thought that this might be an opportunity, highly, um, that this might be an opportunity to explore a little bit more about and what we imagine happened at Mount Sinai, but also how it is that we relate to it. We spend a lot of time talking about the Exodus, um, but we don't always talk a lot about that, that, that experience at Sinai and the way that it's described in, in Torah, the way that it is imagined in the rabbinic mind, and the way that we think about it, um, if we think about it at all. Um, so we'll wait a, a couple minutes and let everybody else assemble. We had quite a, uh, a number of people who signed up yesterday and today. So, um, But I'm not sure, again, how many people are coming in person. Or, my goodness. Okay, we have a lot of people in the waiting room. Oh. So here we go. See, now we're where this room is. No, no, in the waiting room there. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> the digital room. Oh. The digital room. Oh. I, so, uh, oh, look here we go, me. slowly, slowly, everybody's coming on, turning on their cameras, uh -huh. this is so good, welcome, welcome, Phyllis, can you hear us? Good, perfect, that means the microphones are working. Is, it, is that a beard on Barry? Yes. Barry has some shape. Yes. He's going through his Santa Claus stage right now. <laughs> so, I and he, he can't hear us right now. So I that's, thought it was, he was going through his orthodox stage. Yeah, that could be it too. That could be it too. It's really quite a full beard. He, uh, you know, he, he's on um, oxygen too. I would think that that would prevent a good fit, no? Oh, I, no, because the oxygen sinks. I guess uh, it's hard for him to shave. In. There's Vicky. Oh, there's Vicky. Mm -hmm. Yes. That's funny. There's Vicky and Sima and Bart and Phyllis and Santa Claus. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> but it's not white, unfortunately. It looks good. Who's okay. the Zoom so user? Perfect. Somebody who's just simply Zoom user. Mm. You know, one of our without neighbors. Name. Yeah, without a name. Down, I never like that. Right down the hall from him. It's also there. Oh. Which is it is? Ah. Citadel. It's Dan and Gilia. There we go. Hi. You're just listed as Zoom user, so I have no idea until your pictures came up on the uh, on the screen that it was it was the two of you. Welcome, welcome. Hi Kay, you're joining the screen also. Good. Good. Let's turn off our video here. There you go. <laughs> All right. Good, good. Yeah, you're only going to see the people whose cameras are on. There are a couple of other people that are um, either actually here or pretending to be. Um, <laughs> I'm quite sure. Incognito. Incognito. Um, so, um, uh, okay, good. So it's seven o'clock. Actually, 701, and I believe in uh, not penalizing people who are on time. So, welcome. Uh, Elan was asking about the the notion of this class. Where does it where does it come from? And oh, we got a couple more people joining. This is great. We have a full house in person and digitally. All right. Rabbi. Yes. Right, may we do introductions around the table? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so yes, let me just make sure that everybody else is coming on. Okay, people who are in our digital classroom, we're gonna be introducing ourselves in the physical classroom and then we'll do that on the digital as well. And I will call on you and you can just say hi and introduce yourselves. Um, okay, Aline, why don't we can start with you? Aline Frost. Scott Cohen. Shelley Trilling. Janine Green. Stuart Green. 
Paul Cohen. Minna Einhorn. Deborah Magid. Alon Adler. Okay, and uh, Barry, I'm going to introduce you. You're at the top of the screen there, and Phyllis Clapman is in the middle. Bart and Kay Gordon are to the right. Uh, Sima Brown is the next row down on the left. Vicki Weisenberg is in center. And Linda Schubert. Absolutely. There as well. And Daniel and Gilia Cruz are there in the on the couch in the comfy chairs. And uh, I have Alan. Oh, Alan, there you are. Alan. There's Alan and Roberta. Okay. Great. Welcome, everyone. Um, this is so great. I'm so glad that everyone is present physically and digitally. Um, what I wanted to do in this in this two part uh, series was to talk a little bit about the Sinai experience and what it meant to our sages of blessed memory, uh, looking at, at some of the rabbinic texts, both in the Midrash um, and the halachic literature, the legal literature, um, but also thinking about it for ourselves and what it, what it is that we think about when we think about Mount Sinai, how it is that we think about it. Um, and so I've, I've put some text together, but what I want to do first is to look at chapter 19 of Exodus. So for those of you who are present in the room, it begins on page 473 of the Chumash. For those of you who are on the digital, I'm going to share my screen and put up the Safari version. Okay. Um, can you guys see that okay? Uh-huh. Bye. Yeah. Great, great. And I just admitted somebody else. I hope that I did that correctly. Uh, Hershey, great. Okay, wonderful. Welcome. Um, so I just, I, I, we, we seldom read through chapter 19. Um, chapter 20 is where we have the 10 utterances, actually that revelatory moment at Mount Sinai. But chapter 19 sets the stage and contains a lot of information that I think is important for us to understand what Sinai meant, what it can mean. Uh, to us. Um, and so uh, so you're not just hearing my voice. Uh, I'd invite anyone who would like to start reading the English of chapter 19. Uh, some, would somebody like to volunteer to do it? Scott, thank you. On the third new moon, after the Israelites had gone forth from the land of Egypt, on that very day they entered the wilderness of Sinai, having journeyed from so, so I just, I want to pause right here. I'm going to keep doing this. I'm just going to keep interrupting you, all right? Because, again, we gloss over this. We think, okay, this is just introductory material. On the third new moon, the third month, really, it's, yeah, it's, yeah. Is, is what it's what it's referring to. But the new moon indicates um, the beginning of the month. The new moon is actually no moon in the sky, right? Representing the beginning of, of the month. And so... Uh, the Hebrew word for, for month is Chodesh, Chodesh HaShlishi, let's say B'nai Yisrael, maybe it's Rayim, Meir um, means Rayim. And the English is uh, a bad translation. On that very day is not a great translation because what the Hebrew actually says is Bayom Hazeh, which is better translated on as this day, right? right? As on this day. And this is a really powerful idea that the rabbis will glom onto, and we'll see this in some of the texts, that it can be understood as referencing the present day, right? That that Sinai moment was not a singular moment that happened on the third new moon after the Israelites had gone forth from the land of Egypt, but it's Bayom Hazet, right? And it shouldn't be too surprising to us because everything that we do in terms of the ritual observance of the festivals is to remember and place ourselves back in time, right? Um, and that we're, 
in a sense, supposed to reenact that moment. But here what it's saying is that it's not necessarily reenactment, right? Recognize that there's something happening right now by Yom Hazet on this day, right? Um, okay. Ah, uh, I gotta admit it again. Okay, here she's coming back in. All right, Scott, will you continue and I'll keep interrupting. Having journeyed from Rep Rephidim, Rephidim, they entered the wilderness of Sinai and encamped in the wilderness. Israel encamped there in front of the mountain, and Moses went up to God. The Eternal One called to him from the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob and declare to the children of Israel. So let's pause right here for a moment, right? So again, having journeyed from Rephidim, right, this is now, we already knew this, right? So this is again a another uh, apparent, apparently superfluous reference, right? Um, apparently superfluous. And, and, and I only say apparently because it's here for a reason. And what it suggests here is that there's something about this journey and the encampments and the way that it's being worded here, right? Um, and and I, I talked about this a little bit on Saturday night, that the, the attention is drawn to the shift in the, the um, from the plural to the singular, right? Um, and you see it in the Hebrew, you don't see it as much in the English, which is which is a challenge for us, right? But you assume me Rephidim, so it's in the plural, the third person plural, they went out from Rephidim, Vayavou, still in the plural, Midbar Sinai, Vayachanu, still plural, Vamidbar, in the wilderness, right? So all the verbs, Vayisu, Vayavou, Vayachanu, it's all in the plural, right? They all did this, right? And then all of a sudden it shifts. Vayichan sham. So now we go to the singular. So it went from Vayachanu to Vayichan, right? Sham Yisrael neged hahar, against the mountain or aside, next, near the mountain, right? Or opposite the mountain, right? But again, it's it's in looking at this as the singular, going from the plural, that there's something that has that has shifted for the Israelites, right? Um, and one of the commentaries suggests that when they were moving up till this point, there was a lot of carrying on, a lot of dissension in the midst. They weren't really unified. And the idea was that God was ready to give the Torah, to get them to Sinai right away, right? It's not a three months journey, right? Um, but, because they were quarreling with one another, um, they needed to settle down and they needed to recognize and to come together as one. And it was as they unified that that's when they were ready for the receiving of Torah. So I, I want you to put bookmarks on this, right? So bookmark. Um, so it, it's, if you could just mute yourself while the phone is ringing. Thank you. Um, so uh, the, to bookmark Bayom Hazeh, this day, and bookmark this switch to the singular um, in the verb that's used to describe the action of the Israelites. They, in, uh, the, as if the Israelite camp was one and made camp there. All right? Great. Scott, if you go a little bit further. All right. Uh, yeah, but we don't have the rest on the screen. It's oh, thank you. The English thank you. Mountain. All right. There we go. Okay. Good, good, good. Thank you. Thank you for telling me that. I, got, I lost track of that. All right. Very good. You have seen what I did to the Egyptians, how I bore you on eagles, wings, and brought you to me. Now then, if you will obey me faithfully and keep my covenant, you shall... <laughs> the suspense. You shall. Uh, yeah, right there. Okay. You shall be my treasured possession among all the peoples. Indeed, all the earth is mine. But you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and holy and holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the children of Israel. Right. Okay. 
What strikes you with this? This is, I mean, aside from Moses went up to God and the eternal one called to him from the mountain, right? It's, it's, it, the choreography is a little unclear, right? If Moses goes up, presumably he's up, went up to God and now God is speaking to Moses from the mountain, calling out to him from the mountain. Right, so there's a little bit of, you know, what? How do we imagine this? How do we think about where Moses is, where God is, what Moses is experiencing, what God is sharing, and what the people who are encamped down below, what their experience might be? Right. So again, just kind of keeping track of this as we as we move forward. And now, the content of God's first speech now to Moses. You have seen what I did to the Egyptians, how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to me, right? Um, and this is what Moses is supposed to then say to the children of Israel. Now then, if you will obey me faithfully and keep my covenant, you shall be to me, you shall be my treasured possession, right? Uh, and uh, this, this, you know, Yitam li segula, treasure possession, unique position, possession, uh, cherished possession, mikol ha'amim from all the from all the nations, kili kol ha'aretz because all the earth is mine. Right. So, but you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation is a continuation. Right. These are the words that you shall speak to the children of Israel. Okay. So um, I'm going to stop sharing the screen for a moment. Uh, I'm going to admit the lavins. And I'm going to stop sharing the screen for a moment so we can see <laughs> everybody. And I can see everybody. If people, if those of you who are in the digital classroom, um, I want you to be able to participate also in the discussion, ask questions if you have them. And you can do that most easily for me uh, using the digital hand to say that, because I can't always see the physical hand in looking all around. But I see the physical hands here. There was some motion over here. I defer to you first. Okay. Thank you, H before BB, absolutely. <laughs> oh I thought the treasured possession was the Torah and not the people. Right. Am I right or wrong? Wrong. Well, yeah, I mean, for, for us, yes, the gift is Torah. Correct. What God is saying is if you listen, and ultimately the Torah is going to be the content of what the children of Israel are supposed to listen to, then you in turn take on that um, uh, attribute of being a cherished possession or a, a, a treasured possession. Here is the translation, right? But it's, again, among all the peoples, right? There's going to be something unique, right, um, ab about you. Um, and, right, God says very quickly and immediately, right, all this belongs to me, right? So lest you think that I only care about you, don't think that, because everything is mine. I've created everything. Um, in, in here. Yeah, oh, I. I feel I'm reacting to the word possession. They have come out of slavery where they were possessed, possessed. they were owned, mm -hmm. and that's what this strikes me. Now, maybe possession in those days meant something else, but it doesn't feel as though there is freedom there is um choice. a choice thank you yes You're so welcome. i react to the word possession <laughs> right so the choice is follow or, or don't follow it right and mm -hmm. and possession is is not the only way of understanding segula right there's a footnote here um uh that is you know which it corresponds to the akkadian um meaning special property mm -hmm. and to the ugaritic right um, yeah, which is the, the, his special treasure. So not necessarily uh, possession as I own, but something to be regarded with great as, as having great value, 
um, being cherished, right? Um, you know, the, the King James uh, translation was peculiar treasure, right? Which was based on the Latin, right? Mm -hmm. um, so there's, so there's, there are filters on how we understand this word uh, and how, how it gets translated. But, um, you know, the, the, the sense of what comes out of this sense of chosenness and, and all of this, yes. Election. Yeah, election, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and so the rabbis, and we'll see this, um, talk about how Torah was, a, Torah was available to everyone, right? Um, that it wasn't that the, the deck was stacked necessarily because the rabbis too were uncomfortable with this notion of Israelite exceptionalism. Uh, and in fact, later on in the Torah, uh, God will say, don't think you, you know, you're better than anybody else. Um, uh, in fact, the way you've been behaving, <laughs> you know, you're down a couple of notches uh, here. Um, but it's, it's, there's, there's a, um, huh. iPhone Mertz, I don't know who that is. Um, there's, there's this, uh, the, the sense of what covenant is about is I promise to do this if you do this, right? This, that's what the, there's the terms of the covenant, right? And that's what creates not only the sense of being treasured, but also being this kingdom of priests, right? A holy and a holy nation, right? And, and that's really the punchline here. Right, um, is that it's, you know, it's not again for the Israelites to understand that it's not just the Levites who have this particular position, right? Don't mistake that in saying that the Levites are the best of the best. They're not. They have a particular job. <coughs> the goal, however, is for everyone to be to attain that level of holiness where you are um, literally. Uh, a, ki a kingdom or um, a domain that embraces that and that not only embraces it, but reflects that sense, right? And again, remember, this is all prelude to that Sinai moment, that revelatory moment, right? Okay, Shelley, yeah. Okay, but well, then this really says to the people, you have this responsibility because you are going to be a holy, among all the people, you are holy and you are um, a kingdom. Each and every one of you is a, is a priest. Can be, right. Yes, absolutely, right? And again, the language here is very deliberate, right? Im shamoa tishma'un. If you, yea, verily will listen, right? <laughs> if you pay attention, right? Ushmartem, to my voice, right? Ushmartem et briti, and you guard or keep my covenant, then vehitem li stigula, then you will be this cherished treasure, right? Um, more so than any other people. Right? Mm -hmm. They're all treasures, but you're going to shine even brighter is kind of that sense of it, right? Um, so it comes with a condition. Well, the condition is you have to listen to my voice and you have to keep the covenant. And when you do that, you are to me a treasure, right? If you don't do that, you're still mine, but you, should be too but you don't shine too brightly. <laughs> right. Yes, and as we know, later in the prophetic period, that will come back to haunt us. Right. <laughs> right. Right. And and so so this is right, so I, I just again remembering Bayom Hazer on this day, right? Remembering the sense of unity here, and listening to my voice, right? Listening to God's voice. Right? Um. This is one of the very few times where that language is used, right? 
with, again, the assumption that you can indeed hear the voice of God. And again, I want you to kind of file that in as we think about Sinai and what is it that the children of Israel heard? What was that experience like? And what does that mean for us? Okay? So it's a direct vocal to the people, not to Moses to tell the people. But no, this is, this is God telling, this is what I want you to say to Moses, what you want to say to the people. This is God speaking to Moses. Oh, he's still speaking. To Moses. Yes. Right. And so, and then we're going to hear about what Moses does next. But wouldn't it be more effective if we're God speaking to the people? Ah, right. And, and that's, and that's the, the issue, right? What, what is the nature of the revelation? Um, is it is it possible to hear God's voice? And what does that mean to hear God's voice? Right? Is it like you're hearing my voice right now? Mm, probably not. Right. And and so here, so you know, if I was there in that moment, I said, what should they be listening for? You know, is what should what what counts as your voice, God? Because God doesn't just speak. <laughs> Right, not to the people. Right. So, let me hear. so, yeah, so, let me hear this moment. Right. Yeah. The well, in, in a sense, I mean, Moses is communicating on behalf of God to the people, right? So, God, if you could say at this point, Moses' voice is the substitute or the reflection of God's voice. Right. Um, but you know Moses isn't going to be around forever. So again, and this this notion of im bukoli, right? So this there is a at least to my mind, there's a sense that there's something that's ongoing that we have to pay attention to, right? So it's not just following laws because that's the second part of this, right? Ushmartem ad briti. Right? So the first part is im bakoli. If you will really truly hear my voice, hearken to my voice, um, and keep the covenant, right? Then you become that treasure, huh. right? So, so again, kind of bookmarking that a little bit as we as we move along here. Okay, other. Questions before comments or complaints? Mm. Okay. Let's continue on. Would somebody else like to pick up with verse seven? And I will begin to share my screen again so that you guys can see that. Uh, just a second. I'm sorry. I lost where is my, There it is. Select, share. There we go. Okay, so we're now in verse seven. By Avo, Moses came. Would somebody like to continue? Moses came and summoned the elders. Moses okay. came and summoned the elders of the people and put them all and put them before all that the Eternal had commanded him. All those assembled answered as one, saying, All that the Eternal has spoken, we will do. And Moses brought back the people's words to the Eternal. Okay. Right. Okay. It gets better. So it sounds good, right? It's kind of you know, Moses says, tells yeah. them what to do, and every and they say, you know, so it looks like that unity is at least there for the moment. Aline. There's no indication though. I mean, we are questioning people, right? That's what we do here. There's no indication that there were any questions. Correct. Mm -hmm. And that all of a sudden strikes me as fascinating to immediately, presumably, yeah. immediately say yes. Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. So there's something, right? So there's something, I'll get to your story in just a second, but there's something that can be connected to this notion of the, the, the there has been, something has, uh, has, be, uh, has changed with the Israelites from leaving Egypt 
and that moment of panic at the Sea of Reeds and getting through and having a little bit more of trouble and difficulty and complaining and so forth. And here, when it, it, the, 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 the clue, the hint to that is Vayichan, right? The camp is one. Um, and so here, I think there's a little bit of that connection to this where Moses comes, summons the elders, and put before them all that the Eternal had commanded him, and all the people answered, right? So there's this shift. He, he first gathers the elders and then speaks to the people, right? And it's like, yeah, we're in, right? Um, which again indicates that the, the people at this, at least in this moment, are in a different spot, right? We've, we've read the story, so we know that these are fleeting moments for our ancestors, um, and indeed maybe fleeting moments for us as well. Uh, but at least here, they're off to a good start, right? May I yeah. uh, um, continue with yeah. the question in a broader sense? I didn't see it as a positive that there wasn't, that there weren't any questions. I, to me, the way it, the way I heard it as Alan was reading was almost a sort of kind of a blind obedience mm -hmm. rather than <coughs> covenant. Whereas, you know, if you said to me, Aline, da, 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 and I said, yes, Rabbi. But if you said the same thing to me and I said, Rabbi, I want to understand a little more. Before we go into this covenant, can you answer a few of my questions? And then when I say yes, I say yes in a way that suggests contemplation, that suggests I'm not just in at the moment, but I'm, I'm in because I've really processed it. And so that I just wanted to kind of bring yeah. that up. And, and I think there's absolutely that element here too, right? Um, and it's, you know, what did the people perceive as being the, the benefit, you know, the, the good, what's the good stuff here, mm -hmm. right? And for them to think, well, if God is going to look at us as being a special treasure, that sounds pretty good, right? And that we can become somehow this holy nation, this kingdom of priests, because we know what priests are, and priests are usually up above, and they get to do all the neat stuff, and they have more direct contact with the deity, and wow, if we all get to be in that kind of position, yeah, okay, I'm, you know, so there's that element of signing on, and there's also a, it's this different approach, which is absolutely, you know, let me, before I agree to anything, I want to read the fine print, I want to make sure I understand it, right? It's that user agreement, right? Mm -hmm. How many people read the user agreement before they click the box? Nobody. Um, and how many just click the box? Well, it depends on how long the user agreement is and all the details. But we know, gosh, I really want to use this program or I really want to be able to finish signing this document. And so I'm not as concerned with the details. I don't think I'm going to get taken advantage of. Um, and so I'm willing to check the box without fully understanding it in order to get to the good stuff, which is access to the program or to the website or whatever it, whatever it happens to be that is my end goal, right? So it's, it's yes, yeah, it's both for sure. And, um, and, and we'll see that unfold a little bit more as well. Stuart. From a modern perspective, I think Aline's position well, well understood, right. but from an ancient perspective and the perspective of, of ancient religion, it's, they, they looked at the world, I think, somewhat differently than we do. Indeed, they weren't looking at a theology or the fine print. They're looking at, and, and this comes up very early, uh, where, where there's a mention of Jacob mm -hmm. and the children of Israel relating us back to the patriarchs and the covenant with the patriarchs is implied and that is to say, I'm a God who works for you. I'm a God who protects you. I'm a God who got you out of Egypt. I'm a God. And it's not about the fine print. It's about, will this God protect me? Will this God save me? Will this God work for me? And this God has proven that already now and is doing it for me. And I'm going to just, I'm going to sign on because that's what I want from God. And 
that, that's kind of the way, especially ancient religion worked. And for sure, and I think that's, that's why for, with Reform Judaism, and I'll speak specifically about Reform Judaism, is more of that questioning, Aline, that you're speaking of, right? That it's not just blindly accepting this and, and all of the rules that get derived from it and passed down from one generation to the next. They say, okay, let me, let me figure this out, right? Let me understand it. Let me make sure that this is going to be meaningful in that way. So, um, so it's, it's, yes, and, and again, going back to the Bayom Hazeh, this day, right? So this day, yeah, we're actively engaged in challenging the text and in, in, in wrestling meaning yeah. for ourselves out of it. And it gives us, as you were suggesting, Aline, a, a, a deeper buy-in, mm -hmm. right? When we are engaged with it, when it means something to us. And, and so I think, you know, the, the punchline of all of this is that, yeah, that's the Sinai moment. It is when you dig in and really, uh, you know, find understanding for yourself. And that's, that's standing at Sinai, right? That's the Bayom Hazet. That's the this day. And tomorrow, I may hear the voice differently, right? Um, today, this is, this is the experience. This is my, my revelatory moment, right? Um, and Stuart, you're absolutely correct. I mean, the, the, this idea of, you know, back in the day, it's like, okay, are you gonna protect me? You're gonna be with me? If you are, I'm with you. And I'll do what you want me to do in order to continue to be under your protection. Um, you're gonna make my crops grow. You're gonna defend me against my enemies. Um, I'm gonna have be able to have babies and all that, you know, all that stuff that represents blessing. Yes, so I'm in, right? Um, uh, in, in all of this. So we can understand both the response of our ancestors and also to understand that may not be our response in this moment, right? Um, uh, and we have a different relationship and we're in a different, a, a different time. Yeah, absolutely. 100%. Yeah, Jeannie. Rabbi, the Orthodox don't question this as we do the, uh, the reform people, the reform the, uh, movement. Uh, questions, things like that. Are we going to, should we or shouldn't we? Should we sign on the dotted line or should we take God's word, Moses' word for it? But the Orthodox take it word for word for word. That's the God's way and that's how. Well, you're saying two different things, right? So I, I would say that no, they're, they Questioning in Orthodox Judaism is just as important and just as powerful, because they want to right? Um, and at the same time, there are many in the Orthodox community who say, you know, who understand Torah as literally being the word of God. Correct. Right. And it that phrase or that idea means different things to different people. Right. So, you know, Moses Maimonides, we would say, is, you know, would fall. I mean, it's, it would be anachronistic to call him Orthodox. He lived in, you know, the 1100s was not, there wasn't, there, we didn't have those divisions or those streams or those identifiers. Um, but, he, you know, again, he understood that, yes, it's the word of God and the word of God is metaphor. Right. You don't read this literally. It is the word of God. And it's metaphor. And both of those pieces are true, right? For Maimonides, both of those pieces were true. Um, he got a lot of flack for that. Um, we sang Yigdal on Shavuot morning. And Yigdal was Maimonides' response to the folks who were criticizing him for uh, trashing the, the foundation of Judaism. And he said, no, no, no. You know, I believe there's one God. I believe, you know, in reincarnation. I believe in the ingathering of the exiles. I repeat all of these things. The Torah is God's word. And this, that's all what Yigdal is. That whole song uh, is, is set, to, set to music is 
his uh, repudiation of the attack against him uh, in that way. So, so it's it, the questioning is is throughout Judaism. You, you absolutely question. Um, now, you don't necessarily the question the authority of the rabbi, <laughs> but um, but uh, uh, you know because ultimately in the in the Orthodox community, when a question is asked and answered, the answer is the answer. Right. Um, the questions can continue to come, but if you say, you know, to, if you ask, is it okay for me to do X, whatever the X is, and the rabbinic authority says yes, then it's yes. It says no, then it's no, which is a different thing. It says, so it doesn't reject the question. The questioning is yes, absolutely question, continue to question. That's, that's where all the commentary comes from. Right is right. is from questioning and trying to understand and trying to to figure out what does this mean for me today and how I'm supposed to live my life according to Torah in community with connection to God. That's the bottom line, right? Um, in in this, and that's all in this in this preparation. This lead up is giving us that those ideas of what it is that. God is trying to get it because I don't think it's just the Ten Commandments. Okay. All right. Let's move forward a little bit further because we're not. We got to get to. We got to get to chapter twenty. Um, yeah. Yeah. At this rate, it'll be you know four or five weeks before we do sure. that. Right. We have to make sure us right. Exactly. <laughs> right. Right. So um, the Eternal One then says to Moses, "I will come to you in a thick cloud." Yeah, but you're not sharing your screen. Oh. Thank you. Keep me honest. This is so good. Thank you, Sima. Uh, okay. There we go. There we go. Okay. Uh, you're so on the right. Uh, okay, here we go. All right. Um, uh, and it's almost, I will come to you in a thick cloud in order that the people may hear when I speak with you and so trust you ever after. It speaks directly to them. Right? So, you know, it's it's not, you know, well, God told me, you know, everybody should wear green pajamas all the time. <laughs> you know, how do we know that, right? Because I said so. You know, what God is saying, and this is very interesting, right? That it's not, there. there's um, uh, this notion certainly of accessibility, but uh, there was recognition of, you know, people are skeptical, it's not just us, right? And God seems to be responding that I'm going to be in a thick cloud, so you're not going to be able to see me, but people are going to hear, and whatever that means, when I'm speaking to you. All right? Why was that necessary if all of the leaders, all of the... Elders. Elders already agreed. Why was it necessary that God then had to speak directly? I could see it if God, if, if Moses came back and said, hey, listen, we have a problem. Yep. And you need God, you need to go speak to them directly so you can legitimize yourself or whatever. But here, why did he have to, why did God have to do that? Yeah, I, why indeed. And, and, and I, I think that, no, I think that part of it is, again, if, if we can say such a thing, God understands human beings, right? And, you know, it, 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 it's, I don't know, what it was, wasn't it Reagan who said, trust but verify? Yeah. Um, well, it maybe just and, confirmed. Yeah. It, it yeah. was an affirmation so that there would be forward thinking trust. In Moses, perhaps. I think so. I mean, that's, and, and God says that to express it, right? And I speak with you, and so trust you ever after, yeah. right? So this isn't going to be an ongoing thing, but they're going to know that I do indeed speak to you. So when, when Moses says, you know, God told me to tell you that there's an understanding that, yes, God does tell Moses to tell us stuff. Um, and it's and so it's setting it up for 
beyond the Sinai moment, right? Beyond the Sinai moment, because the Sinai moment we're going to get to seems to be much more of a collective experience, not just a mediated experience, right? Okay. All right, let's go a little bit further, right? So, um, then Moses reported the people's words to the Eternal, and the Eternal said to Moses, go to the people and warn them to stay pure today and tomorrow. Let them wash their clothes, let them be ready for the third day. For on the third day, the Eternal will come down in the sight of all the people on Mount Sinai. Right? So there's, you know, get ready. There's something big that's going to happen, right? Um, so there's, there's a momentum that's building here uh, that is, go, it, there's, there's something that, there's, there's an excitement perhaps, something that's happening, and, and a warning, right? You shall set bounds for the people round about, saying, beware of going up to the mountain or touching the border of it. Whoever touches the mountain shall be put to death. You got to go up again, Rabbi. <laughs> okay. I'm, I'm looking at my book and not looking at the screen. Thank yeah. you. Whoever touches the mountain shall be put to death without being touched by either being by being either stoned or shot beast or person of trespasser shall not live. When the ram's horn sounds a long blast, they may go up on the mountain. So, right, there's... There's going to be some kind of a spontaneous instant death if you go beyond the boundary before the shofar blast. When the shofar sounds, that's the all clear. Right? So there's some there's something incredibly wonderful and powerful and dangerous. And dangerous. I immediately think ahead to Nadav Navihu. Yeah. Right? There's something very dangerous about crossing a boundary, of getting too close. They were burned up, but they weren't really burned up because there were bodies to be carried away. And they were wearing clothing still, even though they were burned up, consumed in flame, right? So there is something very, there's again, this danger that's inherent in proximity to the deity. Stuart, you had a... just wanted to talk to what Al Alan was saying a minute ago. And that is, for the people, mm -hmm. they'd heard about uh, all the wonders that had been performed or seen some of them. Uh, but for all they knew, it was because Moses was a wizard, mm -hmm. a sorcerer more powerful mm -hmm. than the sorcerers of Egypt. For the people of Israel, the hearing of God's voice, again, hearkening back to the intimacy of, of the, the patriarchs, was an existential moment, mm -hmm. a literal proof in the hearing of it. Moreover, in, the, in this world, in this time, the voice was more important than the written word and also carried through it the idea of a spirit or a force carried on the respiration because some your your soul was on your on mm -hmm. your on your voice so so to speak and so hearing god's voice was really existential and therefore then could be the power of that voice could be transferred then through to moses mm -hmm. with an understanding that this is god this is the entity that made all this happen yes Yes, and again, it's it's leading up to this direct, unambiguous, unmediated revelation. Right? That's what this is building up towards, and that's what the stage is being set for the Israelites and for us in understanding that there's preparation, right? You have to be pure. You have to wash your clothes. You have to you know, and, and which is no small task. I mean, they're, they're out in the wilderness, you know, they're, they're not in any kind of a dwelling with ready access to water and all those good things that they might need to fulfill this task. So it's, it's something that, that is, uh, that is needed. Alan, I see that you raised your hand and then Bart, I see a physical hand. 
Uh, so I'm going to stop sharing for a moment. Alan Tobin, you're on. Well, I don't know, for good or for bad, I'm sitting here with three different copies of the Chomish. And of course, there are little differences. Yeah. But there's one that stands out for me because it's such a big difference between our reformed approach and today even conservative and the Orthodox, uh, that in one version, uh, being the uh, uh, Butnik edition, that they read into this thing about them preparing themselves for three days, that that's where they get the separation of men from women. Yes. And is there any, and I'm looking also at an interliteral, uh, interlinear edition where supposedly I'm looking at specific word for word translations and it doesn't say that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right, and it, it, it doesn't, to stay pure, to sanctify them. Um, and uh, later on in verses 14 and 15, we'll get this specific, um, uh, or more specifically what that could possibly mean to stay pure. Um, for, the, for the rabbis in the commentary, staying pure means nothing other than don't have a, 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 an intimate physical uh, experience with another person. So that's where that comes in. Yeah. They, they finish number 14 with do not come close to your wife. Yeah. That's... Yeah. Yeah. And that's, that's reading into it. Um, A lot. Uh, you know, it's, uh, <laughs> I think of this, the stereotypical things with the, you know, the boxers staying away from uh, their their wives or their girlfriends because oh. they don't want to have their strength, strength. Yeah. taken away from them. <laughs> uh, I think it says more about the the person than uh, than anything else. And, and again, okay. the interpretation um, is uh, it's it's not um, ex explicit in the text. It's not explicit. It's not. It, it, no. No, not at all. It was, uh, Mark. I guess I was going to ask a question along those lines, perhaps not, not, not as well structured and and uh, and uh, sourced. But is there anywhere else in in the Torah or or any sacred writing where pe people are told to wash their clothes? Oh yes, after death, close the feet. So um, yeah. yes, I mean there's there's specific instructions that are given to the priests. Yeah. Um, when somebody has um, uh, um, fulfilled a, a, a time requirement for uh, changing their status from ritually impure to pure, that that's part of the, that washing, washing your body, um, changing clothes, washing clothes, yes, is a part of that experience. It's a, it's, it's a physical expression of of the spiritual change that is taking place, right? Um, so it gives that, it gives a physicality to it. So yeah, so the short answer is yes, and I'm incapable of short answers um, uh, in that. Yeah, yeah. Um, good, right? So, um, okay, let me go back to the text here, share the text, good. Um, wash the clothes, be ready for the third day. Um, right, so in, in, uh, I'm sorry, so I went too far, uh, without being touched. Moses came down from the mountain to the people and warned the people to stay pure. They washed their clothes. And he said to the people, be ready for the third day. And here it's, I mean, the closest thing, I'll take Shu Elisha. Right? Don't uh, don't go near or don't approach a woman, right? Um, which is 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 hard. I mean, they had to put in in the parentheses if you're looking at the Safaria translation. Uh, the men among you should not go near women, right? Um, just to be clear, so that women can go close to women, yeah. but you know, less you know, lest you you make that mistake. But again. For you know, in this, I you know, it, it's taking something that 
was probably an accepted norm um, in how you prepare yourself be, you know, to be in um, the presence of the deity. Um, and whether it's through ritual or th through group experience, um, it can also go the other way. I mean, that's the bacchanalias and all of that of, of going off the other end and in, in preparation. Um, but here there's a little bit of that as well. Okay. Um, then on the third day as morning dawned, there was thunder and lightning and a dense cloud upon the mountain and a very loud blast of the horn. And all the people who were in the camp trembled. Moses led the people out of the camp toward God and they took their place at the foot of the mountain. Again, the choreography, it just, this would not be linear, right? I mean, there's, there's so much movement and we don't know where Moses is and we don't know where the people are. We thought the people were already at, encamped at the base of the mountain and God was already there and Moses was already there but, and the elders, but here we have led the people out of the camp because they, apparently they were still in the camp, not at the place at the foot of the mountain yet. Um, now, Mount Sinai was all in smoke. For Adonai had come down upon it in fire. The smoke rose like the smoke of a kiln, and the whole mountain trembled violently. The blare of the horn grew louder and louder, and Moses spoke, as Moses spoke, excuse me, God answered him in thunder. So apparently, one way that God's voice is understood is his thunder, right? And not necessarily in words as we had just a few moments ago, right? Um, or at least that was the people's experience of God's interaction with Moses. Adonai came down upon Mount Sinai on the top of the mountain, and Adonai called Moses to the top of the mountain, and Moses went up. Adonai said to Moses, go down, <laughs> right? I just came up the mountain. Now you want me to go down the mountain. Go down, exactly. warn the people not to break through to Adonai to gaze lest many of them perish, right? So apparently there's still great concern. Maybe God sees them pushing and shoving a little bit at the base of the mountain to get a little closer um, and to get to that experience. And uh, so Moses has to go down to warn them. The priests also who come near Adonai must stay pure, lest Adonai break out against them. But Moses said to Adonai, the people cannot come up to Mount Sinai, for you warned us, saying, set bounds about the mountain and sanctify it. Right? So now Moses is a little confused. Where do you want me, God? Where do you want the people, God? It doesn't seem entirely clear. And so Moses is, is posing a very reasonable question. So... God says, go down and come back together with Aaron, but let not the priests or the people break through to come up to Adonai, lest God break out against them. And Moses went down to the people and spoke to them. You know what I don't understand? Is Moses had this speech impediment, and Aaron did all of his speaking for him, and then lo and behold, or verily, uh, it's you so. Yay, verily. Yay, verily. All of a sudden, Moses is this orator. Orator, I mean. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, it, it's, so, the question is, does, is it a physical impediment that Moses actually has? There are some commentaries that talk about that, and there's some fantastical stories about baby Moses in Pharaoh's court and yeah. Pharaoh having a dream that Moses was going to overthrow him and sets up a test and, you know, with the jewels on one side and the hot coals on the other and Moses is about to reach for the jewels as any baby would do because it's bright and shiny and the prophet, Gab uh, the angel Gabriel yeah. moves his hand over to the coals and he picks up the coal and touches his mouth and that's how he gets the speech impediment, right? It's one of those just so stories, how the leopard got its spots, how the tiger got its stripes, how the giraffe got such a long neck, how Moses got his speech impediment, right? Um, but that's not the way he describes it. When Moses describes the, the problem with God giving him this position is that I am heavier, thick of speech, heavy of tongue, right? 
So it doesn't necessarily mean that there was a literal physical impediment, um, but maybe when he got in front of people, he got nervous and he stuttered. And that was how that was communicated. Um, but whatever it was, he got over it, mm. right? And and we know people like this. Um, President Biden yeah. uh, is, is an example, right? Mm. He's very deliberate in his speaking, not because he's slow to think, mm. but because he stutters. And so this is the way that he copes. James Earl Jones, did you know this? Oh, no, that, really? Was a stut had a terrible stutter oh, as a child. Really? That magnificent. That magnificent voice, voice right? Yeah. Um, and so he was able to overcome it through practice and practice and practice and figuring out what he needed to do to overcome the stutter. So I imagine, Shelley, that Moses, in the same way, whatever his reticence was, whether it was he stuttered or he had some you know, he had a lisp, I don't, whatever it was that felt like he would not be the best oral orator representative of God. Yeah, he goes on and speaks and speaks and speaks with great authority. Um, but and also, so, excuse me, I'm sorry, but also by doing that, then you're putting Aaron in a second position. So maybe that's deliberate also. Um, yeah, I don't know if that, if that's the reason, I mean, as you know, Aaron is the high priest, he's responsible for a great deal, but he doesn't, Moses has his responsibilities as well. Um, you know, Aaron's is a dynasty, Moses is not. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I'm not exactly sure that, you know, how that, how that might play out. There are lots of different ideas. Um, in, in this. Okay. <laughs> so <it's> there. Yeah. <laughs> Was there a question from the digital room? No. Okay. All right. So we're at that Sinai moment. Okay. Um, and I wanted to take a, a few moments and then leave the rest of the text for next week um, in this and uh, and to uh, well let's uh, uh, let me look at it uh, I'm going to share my screen once more um, put this back up right so so it, Moses goes down so the end of chapter 19 is Moses went down to the people and spoke to them, right? Um, and we have to assume that Moses spoke to them about the warning about boundaries and, and be very, very careful, right? Um, but we don't have the exact words, which is interesting to me because there's been a lot of back and forth and God has been very deliberate in telling Moses what to say to the Israelites. And Moses has been very diligent in coming back up with a report to God of the Israelite response to this. And this is just kind of left hanging. And spoke to them. But we don't, we expect that there's, what did he say? Um, I, to them. Because the next voice is God's voice. Right? And uh, and then we have we have the ten Utterances, what we did, what we oftentimes refer to as the Ten Commandments, even though not all of them are in the language of command, right? Um, and uh, again, it's it's part of the repetition. If we you know just look back for a moment at verse one, um, where uh, I'm sorry, at verse four of chapter nineteen, right, where God tells Moses to say to the house of Jacob and declare to the children of Israel, you have seen what I did to the Egyptians, how I bore you on eagle's wings and brought you to me, right? So setting up the authority. I'm the one who did this, right? I'm responsible for this. And then the beginning here in verse, in chapter 20, by the bear Elohim, at kol ha'devarim ha'el God spoke all of these 
words these things saying, I am Adonai, your God, who brought you out of the land of, the, uh, land of Egypt, the house of bondage. Right? So, immediately, this is who I am. If you were wondering who brought you out of Egypt, it was me. Right? Um, so, what the, 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 the rabbis will wrestle with and what we'll look at together is... What exactly did they hear? Did they hear exactly what was written, what is written in the text in chapter 20? Right? Um, did God speak, literally speak all these words saying in a way that the Israelites could understand? Right? Because again, thinking back to chapter 19, the God's voice was thunder. To the Israelites, right? right? And thunder is very different than words. Um, and so, did it shift, or is this a later unpacking of what the content of that revelation was? And there's a lot of really interesting commentary on this. So, can I have 10 more minutes? Mm -hmm. Okay, let's take 10 more minutes. Okay, so 10 more minutes, and I wanna just get to the very um, beginning. I have hard copies of Good. this, and what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna share the text on the screen. Um, I'm gonna put the link up there. Uh, Copy link, done, stop share, go to chat, where's my chat, where's my chat, there's my chat, I'm going to put it in the chat. Okay, so for those of you in the digital classroom, the link that I just put in is to the document that people are looking at here physically. Um, you can click on it now and look at it if you've got a screen that allows you to do that. I'm also going to share the screen so that you can see it um, as well. But this will give you the document and if you want to print it out later, you can do that because we'll be still looking at this document um, in our second se session next week. Um, so I'm gonna share my screen. And go to this, what really happened at Sinai. Okay, so we have the blessing. All right. So um, the first question here in, in looking at this is, in, in the verses that we, that we looked at together and, and, and we go forward, what atmosphere does God create for the giving of Torah? How does this affect the people? What about Moses? Why was this an important way to present the Torah? These are the things that I would like you to be thinking about, right? So, um, and we, um, uh, so, okay. Hmm. Just wanna make sure I'm not being texted by somebody in the group. Um, okay, so let's, I'm just having trouble ch taking the two texts and how to present them. Here is easy, on the screen it's not so easy. Um, so what I'm going to do is look a little bit further into verse 20, uh, into chapter 20, right? And uh, if, you, if you look, the, the, we're familiar with the Ten Commandments, with the Ten Utterances. Um, and if you look at the, the verse in, at the very end, in verse 15, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to switch, let's see if I can do this. Can you guys see Exodus 20 now? Not on the web. Mm -mm. Is it still looking at the sheet? 
Okay. Let me so do plenty things like printing or, or tapping. Okay. So I'm going to do this. Okay. Thank you for your patience. So I'm going to zoom through the Ten Commandments to get to verse 15, um, where right after the, the last command, don't covet, right? We have verse 15, all the people witnessed the thunder and lightning, the blare of the horn and the mountain smoking. And when the people saw it, they fell back and stood at a distance. And they said, you speak to us, Moses, and we will obey, but let not God speak to us lest we die. So, so what it calls into question here is we we assume at the beginning of verse of chapter twenty. Now the without, sound is jumbled up on the. Oh, so is her sound. Jumpy, jumpy. You can't hear me. I hear you. No, okay. it's all garbled. It might be your connection. Well, on mine, it won't when I tried. To print and then it said it won't do it and now the sound is garbled. But I can see the original thing you put on, but I can't do anything with it. And I can't I can read it, but I can't hear your sound. Rabbi, you're crystal clear. Right. Yeah, you're clear. Okay. All right. I can hear you okay. clearly. Okay, good. So um so the so the question is because of verses 15 and 16. It calls into again into question what it is that that experience was like for the Israelites because again if we start with just verse one of twenty, it, God spoke all these words saying, and then we have the ten utterances, but what's described in verse fifteen all the people witnessed Am roim witnessed is not a good translation Am roim all the people saw. Et hakolot, the voices, the et halapidim, right? <coughs> the 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 lightning and the the et kol hashofar, right? And the voice of the shofar. The et har ashan vayar ha'am vayanu'u vayamdu mirachok, right? So the people saw voices. <laughs> right? No. Um, and 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 this is what's interesting here is that you know, we get again have this phrase in English when we're talking to somebody, and I say, Deborah, do you see what I mean? Right? I haven't shown you anything, but I've described something mm -hmm. to you. And if I've described it well, you say, Yes, I get it. Right. But we use that that phrase, that idiom, do you see what I mean, when we've been speaking, right? Not necessarily when we are holding up something like a drawing or, or a, a diagram, do you see what I mean, right? Um, or when somebody, you know, when you're talking about people quarreling and you, say, do you see what I mean? They're just quarreling, right? You see this? Um, so. They saw and they saw the thunder, the lightning, the blare of the horn. So they're hearing stuff. They're seeing voices there, and the the whole experience is overwhelming to them. Right. And they said, "No, no, no, Moses, you 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 do this, right? Um, and and you come back and tell us. You talk to God, tell us, because um, they're they're terrified." Um, and, and with good reason, right? Because God has already told them this is dangerous stuff, right? Stay away. Don't come close. If you do, you will die. And it won't be a normal kind of death, right? So, um, so they're already primed. And again, not having a lot of experience with the divine in this kind of close encounter, they're terrified. So, um, so that, that what is, what I'm wrestling with, and, and again, going along to your question of what inspired me to, to do this is trying to come to uh, an understanding of what the text is relating to us in describing this Sinai moment. 
the preparation in verse in chapter 19, and then what the the Israelites actually experienced or what's recorded about them, right? They saw the voices and the, the thunder and the, they heard the shofar, right? Um, but not necessarily the words, right? Not necessarily the words. And, and so what does that mean for us in terms of how we if we talk about it even in this way, how it is that we experience God, right? And how do we, Bayom Hazed, this day, how, what, does Sinai continue to echo for us, right, in, in moving forward? And, uh, you know, again, my answer is yes, but it's much more complicated than that. And, and that's what I want to get to next week is really digging into this. So I, I give you the text. Um, please take it with you because I would love for you to kind of wrestle with these a little bit on your own. And then we'll come back together and, and do this together. Um, I gave everybody the link so you can have it um, uh, for you. Uh, let me know if you have trouble um, reading it or printing it, and we'll figure out another way of getting the text uh, to you as well, unless you're going to be here next week in person, and that way I can give you the text in person. Um, great. Thank you so much for this opportunity. I just am so, I'm so pleased. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and uh, uh, we will gather again next Tuesday, same time, same station. The Zoom link will be the same for those who are participating by Zoom. So the link you have is the link that will work next week as well. Um, and uh, we'll continue our Sinai exploration together. Abby, may I ask you a quick question? I couldn't print. Oh, we're done. Um, I don't know why you can't print it. It should be, uh, you, you shouldn't be able to, you shouldn't have any difficulty doing that. Will there uh, be, I will be in Temple tomorrow. Will there be copies here? That yes, I can there are copies here. Come to Phyllis. Yeah. Okay. All right. Take care, everyone. Thank you. Good night.